Hello everyone. Thank you for standing by and welcome to tonight's webinar sponsored by ISIS Parenting, Bright Horizons Family Solutions, and Sugar Booger. My name is Kim Bennett. I'm the Program Manager for the Child Development Programs here at ISIS Parenting, and I'll be your co-presenter and moderator this evening. During the presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. However, you may submit questions to the speaker at any time by typing them through the chat feature located to the left of your screen or direct them to us, us on your Twitter using our handle at ISIS underscore parenting. We'll take questions at the end of the presentation. Today's webinar is being recorded, and all of you will receive a link to the recording later this week. So if you miss something or need to step away to tend to your baby or toddler, that's okay. ISIS Parenting is proud to co-host this evening's webinar. ISIS is the nation's most trusted prenatal and early parenting destination. We provide innovative programs and a highly edited selection of products for expecting and new families in our four Boston area centers and online at isisparenting.com. Bright Horizons is the leading provider of high quality early education and preschool. Their programs empower children from infancy on to become confident, successful learners, and secure, caring people. They strive to grow young readers, scientists, artists, and explorers who are engaged and curious, and their programs invite children to approach school and academics with skills, confidence, and a drive for excellence. Tonight, for our webinar, Bright Horizons is happy to offer 25 webinar attendees a set of our Toddler Ready for More activity cards, along with a book of excellence selection from a growing reader's book series. Winner, winners will be notified via email, so good luck. And our sponsor tonight is Or Originals, which prides itself on providing essential items that make parenting fun while meeting a genuine need. Each item within the baby line, playfully named Sugar Booger, has its own special blend of modern design and retro soul with a playful dash of mischief for ex extra flavor. One standout product that is in high demand for the 2012 back to school season is the Sugar Booger Classic Cotton Canvas Lunch Sack, offered in 27 playful patterns. All their styles are insulated to ensure that food is kept fresh, whether hot or cold, throughout the day. The hook and loop closure is easy for little hands to open, yet closes securely to avoid playground mishaps. Sugar Booger lunch sacks are just one part of a complete line of sweet and sassy lunchtime necessities that let parents send their little ones to school with a lunch that's special, stylish, and fresh. Be sure to check out Aura's fun and functional products by visiting ororiginals.com or online at isisparenting.com. So like I said, my name is Kim Bennett, and I will be your co-presenter and moderator for our webinar this evening. I've been a part of ISIS Parenting since 2007, and I currently serve as the Child Development Program Manager. My master's degree is from Wheelock College in Infant and Toddler Development and Special Education, and I'm a Certified Early Intervention Specialist. Prior to joining Early ISIS Parenting, I've worked in several area early intervention programs for children with special needs or developmental delays from birth to age three. It's also my pleasure tonight to introduce our co-presenter for this evening, Megan Aida of Bright Horizons Family Solutions. Thank you, Kim. I wanted to introduce myself. I uh, joined Bright Horizons five years ago as a parent of a child enrolled at Bright Horizons. After seeing the quality of care and education my child received, I decided to uh, become an employee of Bright Horizons. I currently work as an enrollment counselor out of um, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. As an enrollment, count enrollment counselor, I support parents every day in selecting the best quality program for their child and helping them to transition into care and early education. I have a son, Joey, who just graduated kindergarten in uh, Bright Horizons, and a daughter, Kelly, who is entering the pre-K program. So I have a lot of firsthand experience with my own children and with the families that I work with in helping them deal with the anxieties and the fears of starting a new program. Thank you, Megan. And moderating our chat room and our webinar this evening is ISIS Parenting's own Nancy Holtzman. Nancy Holtzman is a maternal infant specialist, board certified lactation consultant, and a certified pediatric nurse. Nancy has spent the past 20 years focusing on topics related to infant health and development, feeding and sleep, and is a clinical, clinical founder and vice president here at ISIS Parenting. So 
tonight we are going to talk about your toddler who may be starting a new early education program, preschool, or child care center this fall. So tonight we're going to talk about this transition to a group or early education program, whether it's a preschool environment, a nursery toddler program, um, or just a toddler classroom within a child care center. Um, this may be the first time that you and your, your child is in a group classroom setting being cared for by non-family caregivers, or it just may be a transition to a new center or a new teacher. You're probably excited, but a little anxious as well. All parents and caregivers have certain anxieties about big transitions like this for our very little people. So tonight we're going to try to address a number of these parental concerns as well as give you some helpful hints for getting yourself and your child through this transition. So are you worried about those tearful goodbyes, getting out of the house on time, um, communicating with your teachers, packing for lunch, what your child is going to eat at lunch, changes to their routine, um, what if they use a pacifier for napping, how best do we talk about school to promote some excitement and adjustment, are they going to get sick all the time, what are some self-care skills that your toddler could start practicing now, um, how is your teacher going to communicate with your child if they don't have a lot of language yet in their toddler years. Um, tonight, Megan and myself will address both the developmental reasoning for some of what you will start to see in the classroom and what your child may be going through, as well as Megan will give some real-time logistical tips um, for making the school adjustment more peaceful and more smooth. So we're going to start with some of the main concerns that parents voice to us frequently um, in a way that can be generalized to any type of program that your child may be starting. We, like I said before, we are going to leave some t a time at the end of our presentation this evening for additional questions, um, so please feel free to type those into the chat as they come to you. So one of the first questions that came to us when people were registering and typing in their questions was this piece about separation anxiety. What if they cry when I drop them off? What if they won't let me leave? How do I get them ready for being cared for by a different person? Um, I want to start with describing a little bit about separation anxiety. Um, some refer to it as stranger danger. Um, there's lots of different titles for it in the parenting world. Separation anxiety typically starts for most infants at around nine months, some earlier, some later. And it actually extends through the preschool years. It's not just something they go through between nine and 12 months and they're over it. Um, typically, you see it coming back as they enter different stages of development and social development and awareness. Um, it is uncommon in most children to continue really past preschool um, and into the school years. Um, that usually is a sign of a different type of concern of your child's anxiety. So really through preschool is where, and kindergarten is where we want to see this separation anxiety end. Um, Separation anxiety for kids at this age depends slightly on their experience with separating, but also mostly based on their own personality and temperament. This could be the first time you've left your child with a non-family caregiver, or this could be the 100th time you've left your child, and they still may be having a difficult time. Whether you've brought them to a child care program in the past or not, this is still a new place, still a new teacher, new people, a new routine, and it's still not you. So it's going to have a period where your child is going to be adjusting. For some children it's a day, for some children it's a month. Um, the really important thing to remember about separation anxiety in the toddler years, it's a very typical and a, actually a very healthy stage of their social development. As sad and scary as it is to leave your child, like the little guy in this picture, crying as you walk out the door, it is a good thing because it's an indication that they have a strong attachment to you. We would be much more concerned if you walked out the door and they didn't care at all. Like I said, the severity of your child's separation anxiety really depends on their own temperament. Um, the only time teachers begin to be concerned about separation anxiety um, is if your child is completely unable to be soothed or comforted eventually. They're not able to be distracted. Um, but remember that it will take some time for your child to build trust with these new teachers, with this new environment. Just like it took them some time to build attachment and bonding and trust with you when they were infants. Um, so I, with kind of a little background of separation anxiety, um, I want to bring the um, 
back to Megan, and Megan's going to touch on some real um, parenting concerns and specific tips that we can help with parents who are concerned about separation anxiety. Great. Thanks, Kim. I think the biggest, probably one of the most uh, talked about concerns when talking to parents that are starting in early education or uh, group care environment is the separation anxiety. So I definitely have um, come across this topic often. We encourage at Bright Horizons, and I encourage um, all parents when starting a new program to really practice um, set up transition visits and practice days with your program. Encourage uh, your child and communicate with your child so that they understand where you're going. Talk to them about what you're doing and go and, and visit the school and spend, spend time. So these transition visits may be one day where you're coming and visiting the school, talking about the environment, letting them actually participate in, in the room and, and staying with them for maybe a half hour to, to maybe an hour. The key to this is communicating with that child that, you know, this is where you're going to go. I'm going to drop you off and I, I'm going to leave and I am going to come back. I think one of the things that parents have to understand is that sometimes your child may not be speaking when you start this program but they do understand what you're saying. So if we can communicate with the child that mommy is going to drop you off, mommy is going to go to work, and mommy will be back, they will understand when you do come back and be very confident that this is the routine that they follow. So these transition visits and practice days are really good for them to build confidence knowing that although you leave, you will come back. Not only do these transition visits help the child assimilate to the environment and the routine, but as parents, it really helps you get comfortable with the environment as well. We also encourage a drop-off routine. You know, kids thrive on routine, and you know, it's really important to create a routine and follow that routine on a daily basis. Some examples that we give is, you know, bring your child in, hang their bag up on the hook, and maybe go into a cozy corner, grab a book, and read with your child one story a day, and they'll understand that this is the routine we follow. After mommy reads me this book, she leaves, I complete my day, and she comes and picks me back up. I can use my daughter as an example. She has had a rough time with each transition that she's made within the school, although she's been there for four years. Each room that she's transitioned into has been a new environment, and there has been a little bit of separation anxiety. The most recent room that she's been in, the teacher helped to give me the suggestion of, let's start a routine where Kelly will actually take you to the door and actually pretend that she's pushing you out of the door. And it's a kind of a funny event for us. She pushes me out the door, she gets a little laugh, and, and I leave. So it's our routine. It's what we do every day. And if I forget, she reminds me. So really finding that routine, whether it be waving at the window um, as you leave or, or whatever it may be. But communicating with your child is the key to this so that they understand what is happening and that nothing is a surprise. The other thing that we really have to keep in mind is that we, you really need to form that relationship with your, with your child's teacher and the primary caregiver and early education specialist that will be working with your child so they understand what the anxieties or the worries are for that child. Is it just when you leave and then when you're gone, they, they're fine and they, they recover quickly? What is it that they need to, to recover? So that relationship with your child's teacher is crucial. There may be a time that that child is holding on to your leg and it's a very, very hard for you to step away, and that's where that teacher needs to come into play and really help ease that transition. So the better bond you have with that teacher and really opening those lines of communication can really help ease the transition in the morning. And the other thing I always stress to parents is to give it time. You know, it is, like Kim said, it's very, very normal for separation anxiety. If you stick to a routine and you're communicating with your child and letting them know what to expect, understand that Although your child may be crying, they're very good at making us feel extremely bad about leaving them. But I guarantee if you stick with it and know your center or your school's policy on calling to check in on them in, in five, ten minutes and see how they're doing, it will help to ease your mind letting, them, letting you know that they were fine right after you left. I can tell you that nine times out of ten, if my child is upset when I leave, 
I usually get a call from my center before I call in saying, you know what, Kelly was fine about five minutes after you left. So give it time. Realize that it's a completely normal occurrence. The more you stick with it, the more the better the routine you get, the more comfortable you and your child will be with, with separating. Thank you, Megan. Um, mm -hmm. in, terms of trans in terms of transitions, one other area that can be a big transition for some families who are starting a program like this is the actual routine of getting there in the morning, getting out of the house, physically making it to your program on time, and ways to simplify this process, streamline it, and make it easier. Also, these are situations where your child's routines actually may be changing. Maybe they sleep in every morning until 7.30 and now you have to wake them up by 6.15 to get them up and dressed and out in the car on time. Um, so I'm going to have Megan um, talk about lots of different ways that we can start to change these routines early um, and allow for some accommodation for our children and giving them some time to transition. Go ahead, Megan. Sure. Well, I encourage families to establish a routine um, and, and stick to it. So whether it be, you know, I know at my house and what I encourage families to do is ease the morning by preparing the night before, setting out your clothes for your child, letting your child help you pick out the clothes the night before, or pick out two outfits so they only have, they have an option in the morning and it's not finding one whole outfit, it's choosing between two. So setting out clothes the night before, preparing lunches the evening before, getting everything ready to go. So that way that morning you can just follow the routine of the morning, getting up, having your breakfast, allowing plenty of time for unforeseen obstacles. Pre definitely do a few dry runs. If you do start a program and, and you have to be somewhere at a certain time, we definitely encourage you to practice Definitely account for traffic, account for unforeseen potty stops that have to be made, dirty diapers that might have to be changed prior, prior to leaving the house. But definitely, again, follow that routine and let your child be a part of that routine, giving them options, saying, okay, now we're going to eat breakfast. Would you like this for breakfast or this for breakfast? But make sure it's in a routine so that they're very comfortable and nothing is happening out of the ordinary. But preparing for the day before will help ease that routine and allow for it to, to run a lot smoothly, more smoothly. We encourage you also, most of you have decided on a program to start possibly this fall. We encourage you to start practicing this routine early, weeks prior to the change. So if it is that your child usually stays up later in the summer and gets up later, I encourage you to start this process you know, early August, middle of August, to start getting them to bed. Talk about what's going to happen in the next couple of weeks, getting them to bed a little bit earlier, getting them up a little bit earlier, starting that routine so that way when it comes time to actually get out of the house, it's a little bit, a little bit easier. We also encourage you to start working on the self-help and, and independent skills that your child may need. So depending on the age of your child, get, have them start trying to dress themselves. Put out their clothes and see what they can do on their own. This will not only help you with your routine in the morning, but will also help them as they transition into a group care or early education program where that independence is really key for them. So start encouraging that, that independence. We'll talk a little bit more about the eating and how to encourage independence with, with feeding and eating, um, eating lunch and snacks. But as far as preparing in the morning, let's talk about you know, how, letting them practice putting their shoes on, practice putting their coat on and zipping and things like that so that they're, it will make your job a little bit easier in the morning. And like Megan was saying, one of the other major logistical concerns that parents are concerned about when they're starting a program like this is lunch, snack. There are a lot of programs involve children eating. Most of the time you have to pack something for them to eat. So what do you pack? How do you pack? Um, again, we're still talking about the toddler age group. These are still little, little guys. Feeding and sleeping can still be huge areas of concerns for families. Um, picky eating tends to start to begin around this age bracket as well. And also, as parents, we're still really concerned that our little ones are getting their food and their sleep needs met. Food is energy. 
healthy eating and food choices can make all the difference in the world for a little one's energy and ability to focus in a classroom setting. Um, so Megan, what are some great suggestions for our families in terms of what to pack for snack, how to pack for snack, and to ease that eating process at school? I always encourage parents to pack in small, easy to open containers. It creates a much more fun, exciting experience for the child. They really do love the different, um, you know, your, their snacks and their food being in more colorful, bright containers. Uh, Sugar Booger is a great example of um, a company that sells um, great, innovative products to package lunches. So, you know, that all is always a way to make it um, more exciting and innovative for the kids. But we encourage you in those small containers to pack foods that are easy for your child to self-feed. You know, at a toddler age, we understand that your child is, is slowly learning this, um, you know, to, to feed on their own and be totally independent. And in a group care setting, in an early education environment, they may need to feed themselves, start feeding themselves to satiate themselves while they're waiting for the teacher to help them with the, with the rest of their meal. So we encourage you to pack small bite-sized pieces, little crackers, anything that they can pick up on their own so that they can start feeding, especially if they're hungry, if they're very hungry and there's eight other kids in the class. And, you know, we want them to be comfortable and satisfied quickly. So definitely providing an, a variety of foods um, so that, you know, they can have options and they can satiate themselves um, while waiting for, for other help. We do have a lot of uh, resources at the end of this webinar uh, that will give you great ideas on what to pack, actual items um, that are great for toddlers. We do uh, recommend different, you know, there are a lot of, um, your school may be a peanut-free school, so there's a lot of options um, out there for peanut-free items. I know parents say all the time, what should I pack if I can't pack anything that is processed in a, in a factory that has peanuts or um, anything that, that would have a peanut allergen in it. We have a lot of resources available to help you with that, and, and you can access them at the end of the webinar. But we do encourage you to um, keep it fun for them. We, we, I always encourage parents to have your child be involved in the process of packing lunch. You know, at an early toddler age, this might not be as easy to do, but as your child gets a little bit older, have them be a part of the packing process. So whatever you make for dinner the night before, consider you making more and, and packing those leftovers. Talking to your child about what you're packing and using that time to talk about healthy options and balanced meals and let your child help you to prepare the meal for the, for the next day. A lot of schools and programs have a catered lunch program. Take a look at the lunch program. See if it's something that you would want your child to eat. Is it healthy? Is it fresh fruits, fresh, fresh vegetables? And then consider trying that program. You know, a lot of times I talk to parents who say, oh, my child will never eat that. But you'd be amazed. My, both of my children, as an example, ate so much better at school than they did at home because they were sitting against, along with their peers, trying new foods along with the comfort of their peers and talking with their classmates about the healthy options and the meals that were on the table. So talk to your program about their catered lunch program if they do have it, and consider participating in that to get your child to try more of a variety of foods. And I think one thing we touched on as well is that this tends to be one of the age groups where picky eating begins. Um, so acknowledge that that stage is happening in your toddler. Um, there may be some days where you pack five things for lunch and four of them come back at the end of the day in the lunch box not being touched. Don't think that your child is going hungry. Part of the picky eating stage is there may be some days or weeks where your child eats everything and eats all that you pack for them, and other days where they only eat one thing. Um, children do not starve themselves. They do eat when they are hungry, um, and it could just be a small stage that they are going through, which is why some of the reasons why Megan just described can be helpful for things like a catered lunch program. Peer pressure is a good thing in a toddler. If they see other friends eating healthy, they may be like more likely to eat healthy as well. Um, 
but do acknowledge that picky eating can happen. Um, and so pack a variety of options for children if you're really concerned about how much they're taking in during the day. Um, just to add to that, if we talk a little bit more about this, um, learn about the accommodations that the center or the school will make for your child who needs assistance with, with eating. If your child is not very comfortable with a spoon or not very good with an open cup, make sure, again, we go back to that communicating with your teacher, communicating with that caregiver so that they understand the needs of your child. The key to a, a very successful experience in an early education program or group care environment is having those open lines of communication with your teacher or caregiver so that they understand your expectations and they understand the needs and, and the, um, the, the skill level of your child. So we want to make sure uh, that the accommod special accommodations are being made for children who need assistance eating. If your child does need help with a spoon and, and you send them with a yogurt, make sure you send those small bite-sized pieces again so that they can be eating that while waiting for the teacher to accommodate them with the other um, items that they may need. Again, we have more resources to help you with ideas for foods to encourage self-eating, so we would encourage you to take a look at those. We also will want to talk about again about the self-care skills, more so on the eating side. Start, enc start encouraging the use of, of an open cup at home. I know it can be messy. I know milk can spill, and it's a mess to clean up. But start it at home. The, your center or school hopefully will can you'll communicate with them that you want them to continue that experience at school and really start prepping them for the use of a spoon and the use of a fork before they go and they will just be set up for a little bit more success when they are in a, in a group care environment. So the more you can do with your child before they start that environment, the better. But communicating with that teacher where what your expectations are, what are you doing at home to get them to that level, and how is it going so that you can continue to work to get them to that more independent level of, of eating. And again, tonight we're talking about you know, kind of a wide range of toddlers. So you, it may be everything from a one-year-old who is starting a child care center for the first time to an older four-year-old going off to preschool. So again, some of these self-care skills um, your child may have already accomplished, but what about things like your child opening their own juice box, opening their own applesauce, going all the way to the other side of the room and grabbing their own napkin when they make a spill. So these self-care skills are things that we're working on with all ages of our toddlerhood. Um, so I think, again, it's really important to start practicing some of these skills at home. Some parents are a little um, shocked when they find that their children are they have to open their Capri Sun all by themselves, and they have to use this all by themselves. They have to throw everything away. How do they know where the sink is? They don't even do that at home. Um, so acknowledge all of these great self-care skills that we are working on at school that you can continue to build on in the home environment as well. One of the other major questions that comes through, especially if you have never been to a group care, early education, child care classroom before, is the exposure to germs. Um, again, one of the biggest worries that ha parents have is if this is their fir child's first time in a larger group care setting, is how teachers and pro the program are going to keep their child safe. So this could be safe from germs and preventing your little one from getting sick every week, or safe from another little friend who may be a little bit of a kicker, or a hitter, or even a biter. Um, so I think it's really important to consider kind of what your program does to keep your child safe. I'm going to let Megan touch on that from a classroom perspective. You know, I always communicate with parents, you know, when they ask about the illness and the sick, you, what are the expectations? You know, I get the question all the time, will my child be sick? When should I expect them to get sick? And, you know, I always stress that, you know, just understand that your your child will will get sick. It, it is pretty much inevitable that in, when you're exposed to these germs, they will get some sniffles and some coughs and it, it, it will happen and, and um, you know, hopefully with not much severity, but there will be some, there will, there will be, they will get sick. What we want to know is that what is your program's policy or their procedure for cleaning and preventing illness from spreading? Most programs have 
sick and illness policies written out that are signed by parents so that you know, can, we can really stress the importance of curbing illness when it does break out and, you know, helping families to understand how to keep illness at bay and how to follow the, that, that uh, policy. We at Bright Horizons employ a cleaning service nightly to come in and deep clean our centers. You know, our teachers are educators and they're here to educate our children and care for our children. They, they clean throughout the day which is definitely something that has to be done all day long. But we also don't expect them to deep clean a room, which has to be done to keep illness at bay. So there is a cleaning service that comes in nightly to clean and deep clean the environment. So ask your provider what is being done to keep the room clean and to prevent illness from spreading. And what are we doing? What is being done with the toys? What is the toy rotation policy and the cleaning that's done to the toys on a daily basis? basis. So understand how that, how that works at, on the center level. But then also understand what the center is doing, what the school is doing to prevent illness from spreading, and how you can copy that at home. At Bright Horizons, we have a Staying Healthy campaign where we're starting at the young age in the infant room of wiping the child's hands with antibacterial wipes of teaching the children how to wash their hands, of teaching them to cover their mouth with their inside of their elbow when they cough. They're learning all of these habits to stay healthy and prevent germs from spreading at the earliest age. And we encourage parents to continue those practices at home. So really understand what your school is doing and, and as far as cleaning and as far as teaching your child to prevent the spread of illness, and that will really help you to keep that, the sickness and the illness at bay and from getting too, too, too bad or from, from really spreading. So learn your center's policy and, uh, and continue it at home. In the same vein of safety, um, this may be the first time where your child is in a large group setting with lots of other toddlers. In that respect, this is the time where children are learning how they are supposed to interact with their peers. Um, it's a learning process. If I'm playing at the sand table and I turn and bite my friend, I'm probably going to be asked to leave the sand table. So maybe next time I won't bite my friend because I don't like leaving the sand table. It's this trial and error of children learning how they're supposed to interact, what they can do to their friends, what are appropriate ways to get attention, what are appropriate ways to share, to touch, um, to be around their friends. Um, it is very typical that children in the toddler age group will experiment with different ways to play and interact. Um, parents always joke that the word gentle is something we start working on at around six months and we continue to work on through the twos and threes. Um, instances where kids may get hit, get a kick, get a bite even, especially around lunchtime or nap time, these things happen. They happen very frequently in toddler and preschool classrooms as children are learning these behaviors and they're learning social norms. These are typical and these are okay. Um, we don't want to prepare to tell people to prepare for these, that these are inevitable, um, but we don't want you to be shocked and appalled if these things do happen. The one thing that's really important to remember about the toddler age bracket is that for these little guys, their hands and their mouths are their social tools. That is how they interact. They point, they push, they grab, they talk, they kiss, they bite. That's how they interact with people. So we're teaching them appropriate and non-appropriate ways to use their hands and mouths. Um, if an incident like this does happen to your child in a group setting, it will not traumatize them. It rarely even upsets them. They get past it. They're resilient. It's usually more scary for us as the parents than it is for your child. Um, so just understand that that's where this is coming from if, you start to, if that's one of your concerns about starting your child in a program. Um, so Megan, what are some ways that classrooms handle kind of these discipline or behavior problems with this age group? Again, I'd encourage you to communicate with your teacher and learn their policy on handling the situation. What is it that they do when the child bites or kicks or hits? And how does that teacher handle the situation, talk to the child about it, 
and redirect them in a more positive way so that you can continue that behavior or that um, discipline style at home. I think one of the things as well and, and that we want to remind you if you have chosen a, a program or maybe you haven't, is you want to find a program that matches your parenting philosophy. So you know, if you believe and you feel that um, this is how you want it, something to be handled, a situation, we want you to make sure you're communicating that with the teacher and your understanding and your expectations are being met by them and that you can continue um, to follow what they're doing at school at home. So learn their policy for, um, for disciplining as far as if there is an incidence of being hit or kicked or bitten so that you can follow that at home. And then also recognize how they um, communicate with the either the biter's family or parents or the person who was bitten, and learn you know what the what their um, it is a normal occurrence. So that they how do they handle um, you know communicating this with with the families and what are their next steps to helping avoid this from happening again. I think in the same respect of finding a program that matches your own parenting philosophies. For a lot of parents who may be first-time parents or this is the first time they're entering their child into a group child care setting, you know, they have some real concerns about how teachers are going to be able to address their child's individual needs in a group setting. If you haven't had a child in a first or third grade classroom before, this is a brand new situation for you. Um, a lot of your concerns about how your teachers will be able to you know, handle your child's individual needs can be alleviated just by what Megan said, finding a program that matches your parenting philosophies. Unfortunately, we're not here all night tonight, so we're not able to talk about how to find a program. Um, for that, like I mentioned at the end, we're going to have lots of references for you, including some webinars and checklists, both from Bright Horizons and from ISIS Parenting, about choosing quality child care programs. So tonight this is more an opportunity to talk to, find out how to communicate with teachers now about what a program does with lots of different types of scenarios. Um, so Megan, what are some of the tips that you can give from a teacher perspective on um, but making sure the program matches what a parent is looking for. Well, you know, a lot of times I get questions uh, from parents as they're beginning to start or transition into an early education program, especially at a young toddler age, um, but also up through to preschool, that maybe the child is still attached to their blanket or their lovey, or they still use a binky, um, or maybe they're still on one bottle a day, you know, before their nap. And how will the program <laughs> accommodate the children that still have those security pieces. You know, when we're talking about finding a program that matches your parenting philosophies, consider if you want your program to continue the use of these security pieces or if you want them to help you break the habit. So, you know, especially most programs out there, Bright Horizons included, will follow the teachers or the, the parents lead. If you want the the center or the um, the school to help your child to move on from the binky, then this is something we can do together to help have that child, you know, say goodbye to the binky and and get more comfortable without it. But understand what their um, what your expectations are for them as far as accommodating your child, and how do they um, console your child? Do you want your child to be consoled every time that they cry, or do you want them the center to let them cry a little bit and try and work it out. So again, most programs will follow the lead of the parent and say, you know, how do you want to handle this? How do you handle it at home? Again, the key is communicating with the teacher and letting them know your expectations so that what you're doing at home is, is matched at school. We also talk and about the consistent – go ahead, Kim. Um, I think one of the most important kind of jobs of parents or caregivers as they're starting this transition process and preparing their child for a program or a preschool um, is that this is a really great opportunity to kind of take a step back and think about your child's personality, learning style, temperament, sensitivities, because this is your opportunity to educate the teachers about your child. 
um, they're not going to learn overnight. It's taken you two, three, four years to learn all the ins and outs of your little one. Um, all children are individuals. They all have things that make them special and unique. So it's really important to communicate, like Megan was saying, about what your expectations are. But this is when you communicate everything about your child. Lots of um, parents, when they're filling out questionnaires prior to the start of a child care or preschool program, they're asked things about what does your child like to do, how do they like to sleep, you know, what are the toys they like to play with, what is their routine during the day. Um, this is a really important time to communicate with the teachers everything that's about your child. If your child is really shy and slow to warm, if they're really sensitive to certain textures or sounds, if they're a very visual learner, if they're really active, if they need to move, if they have a short attention span. Um, these are also the things that you need to start passing along to your program and to your child's teachers in terms of your child's learning style. So that way they can learn to accommodate all the individual needs of your child as well as what's best for the entire group because there's also probably six to ten other children in the same room that they need to accommodate their needs as well. Go ahead, Megan. When we, when we think about individual concerns, you know, and I know a lot of questions were posed uh, during registration about napping. And you know, uh, a lot of people as they're starting, a lot of children as they're starting new programs are transitioning from either multiple naps or from one nap to no naps or, you know, whatever it may be, their sleeping patterns throughout the day may have to change. And we want to encourage the consistency between home and school. A lot of uh, families out there might start children in a part-time program, which is very common as you're beginning a program. And you may, the child may be home two days or three days a week and at school the other two or three days a week. Again, like I mentioned before, routine is so important. Children thrive on routine. So if they're at school two days a week and they follow a particular schedule where they go down for a nap at 12.30 and they follow a routine to fall asleep and then they're up by three, we strongly, strongly encourage that same routine, although it may be difficult on those days when they're not at school and you may be running errands, try and stick to that routine, that consistency when your child is home so that it's easier for them to acknowledge or to really understand that this is, this is the routine whether I'm home or whether I'm at school, and that transition for them will be a lot easier and less confusing. So definitely as far as napping is concerned, understand, also communicate with your, with your uh, child's teacher what, you, what your expectation is. Do you want your child to definitely fall asleep at 1 o'clock or do you, do you want them to fall asleep on their own and you're okay if it doesn't happen until 2.30? What are your expectations? What do you want them to do? And then be consistent with that at home. I think a lot of what we're talking about tonight is kind of communication with teachers ahead of time, communications with programs. But what if your concerns are how your child is actually communicating during the day with their teachers? Concerns in expressive language development and rates at which children develop communication skills can be a great area of concern for parents of children at this age group. Um, this can become exacerbated when your child is being cared for by non-family members who may not be as familiar with the ways that your child communicates. So I think it's important to just briefly touch on that expressive language is how your child communicates with you. The words, the gestures, the signs, the sentences, the phrases, the sounds that your child is using. Um, how, we know what our child's noises and gestures mean, but their teachers may not. So it's important to remember that, you know, very briefly, some you know, toddler milestones to consider as you're starting your child in a toddler program. Um, we have at ISIS Parenting a language webinar where you can get a lot more information on the development of infant and toddler language, and the, re the references for that will be at the conclusion of the webinar this evening. Um, but you are there to help. You're not going to be there during the day to help translate for your child. So if your child speaks a different language at home and they go to school and start saying shoo, you know that means what in Arabic your teachers think it means shoe. Um, when your child says do do, your teachers may think that means potty, but to you at home, you know that that means that's what he calls his grandfather. Um, so it's also important to know kind of what those individual concerns are of how your child communicates. On average, eight children by 18 months can use an, an average of 20 words that your family will understand. They're mostly nouns and labels, but again, they can be things like da, 
is car. It's not a true word, but you know what the meaning of it is. By 24 months, children on average use between 50 and 100 words, and they're starting to combine some of these words into phrases. So maybe they say, no milk, more please, daddy up. And they're trying to put some more verbs into their vocabulary as well. Typically by three, kids are using anywhere between 75 and 250 words. And those phrases can start to increase to phrases of three or five words. They're building sentences at this point. Again, you see gigantic ranges in how children um, are using their expressive language. And that's in part because this is one of the areas where children vary the most in terms of their areas of strengths and concerns. Um, but it's really important at the end of the day, children will find ways to get their needs met. So even if they're saying something to their teacher and their teacher is not understanding them, they will most likely grab that teacher's hand, walk them over to the kitchen sink, and point to the cup on the counter. Um, they're resilient and they will find a way to communicate. So I think it's a great chance for Megan to talk about how a teacher may be able to handle um, a child in a classroom that's not able to speak as much or be able to kind of communicate those needs. I work with families on a regular basis who, you know, this is an extreme concern for them. You know, their child may be 18 months, almost two years old, and does not have the communication that they are expecting, maybe not what they're reading in books as far as what level they should be at. And I'll definitely use my own son as an example. At two years old, he wasn't talking, and I thought, how is he ever going to get or make it in a two-year-old room? when every other child is speaking. One, we talked earlier that peer pressure is wonderful. So putting them in an environment with other children that are speaking is a great, a great influence on their language development. But understand and realize that it's not unusual. Teachers are trained on how to understand needs of children without being able to communicate. Children communicate in many ways, like like Kim said, they can get their, their message across without um, actually using words. However, once we do recognize and teachers recognize what that child needs, maybe they're not verbalizing it, but they're pointing, the teacher will help them to verbalize what they want. So, you know, whether it's a feeling that they have, whether they're angry, or whether they want a drink, and they're communicating this in, in a way that may not be verbally um, clear, the teacher can take that and really work with the child to, to get them um, to, to be able to verbally express how they're feeling or, or their wants or their needs. You know, we also, the group care setting and the, and the early education setting is, is a great environment for language development because it's helping the children um, talk with, or allowing the children to have conversation with their peers. So with people, with little, little beings that have the same level of language as they do. So it really helps them to develop their, their language and, and really help it to grow, and the teacher will be there to facilitate that conversation. So understand that teachers are very, very used to this, and it's not new to them, but communicating with them on the level at which your child is, is at and, and you know, any concerns that you have will help to facilitate the language development with your child. You know, we do encourage signs. Uh, I mentioned that my son was two and not using using language, you know, not really speaking very well. However, he, he was great with signs. So we started that at a young age, and um, I communicated with the teachers the signs that he used most frequently. And that was how the teachers really got to communicate with them with him at first. And then once they realized what he needed, with the signs they put the words, and, and you know, with, without much time, my child was able to communicate what, what he needed. So really working with uh, the teachers on what you use at home to understand um, and communicate with your child. I always work with, I very often work with families who are maybe bilingual or trilingual or, you know, maybe the child does not speak any English at, at all and they're concerned about their transition into to group care. Well, it's amazing how fast a, a young child will pick up um, the English language and be able to communicate their needs. But, you know, at the initial onset, it is going to be difficult. 
at Bright Horizons, we always ask parents to supply a list of common words. Uh, Kim mentioned a few in Arabic that we, would, we wouldn't necessarily expect our, our teachers to know these words, but if you supply those words to your teachers so that they can start using them in, in daily conversation, it can help the children feel very comfortable in their environment and um, express their needs and, and concerns um, in, a, in a more easy, easy way. So at this point, we're going to open it up to maybe one or two questions um, that we people have been sending through our chat rooms. And I think the first question would be a great one for Megan to address. Um, so we've had some questions come through about classroom size um, in terms of what programs typically use for toddler age groups, what they are allowed to do in terms of how many children and teachers are in classrooms for large programs and small programs. So Megan, can you speak to that for a moment? Sure. You know, check with your um, with your with your program. Obviously, um, you know, I as I mentioned before, I am an enrollment counselor in Pennsylvania. State regulations are different, and ratios are different in every state. But technically, or typically, um, at Bright Horizons, a traditional toddler program, which would be about 18 months to three years old, would follow a six to one ratio: six children to to one teacher. Again, this may vary depending on your state regulations, um, whatever your, your state mandates as far as um, regulations to ratio. But a typical toddler class size would be either 5 to 1 or 6 to 1 depending on the age, the age requirements of the class. And as far as capacity of the room, consider that as well. You know, you might have, um, you know, at Bright Horizons, we have multiple rooms in most of our centers, so multiple toddler rooms. So we're able to keep our ratios down and our capacity a little bit lower because we have the multiple rooms. So it may be six to one. We may have two, 12 children in a class with two teachers. Um, and, but we also have um, multiple toddler rooms so that we can keep the capacity down and, and ratios as low as we can. So a lot of other questions that have been coming through are things that I think would be great to send to our resources. So as we mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, this webinar has been recorded. You're going to be receiving a copy of it by the end of the week as well as a link to all of these resources. Um, here at ISIS Parenting, we provide individualized and personal sleep consultations as well as parenting consultations. So if you have concerns about transitioning toddler naps, you know, waking early, um, going to bed at a later time due to a way earlier wake up, or you have concerns about parenting consults for behavior discipline concerns, maybe starting toileting at a child care program, concerns about picky eating or transitions, um, there's some great resources available for you. Um, also, we have our uh, other free online webinars available on our website about choosing child care, potty training, feeding, and language development. Um, Bright Horizons has a great eFamily News electronic newsletter that provides weekly um, emails about advice, strategies, tips, and resources. So their website is a great place to check as well. They have free online web webinars as well on potty training and preparing for school, as well as some checklists on in terms of choosing quality infant toddler or preschool programs. I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. We've come to the end of our presentation this evening. Um, so please remember to check your email for the presentation recording. Like I mentioned, we will send it out later this week via email. We'll also include an information sheet with links to all of the products and websites that were mentioned tonight during our talk. Megan, I want to thank you so much for sharing this valuable information with our audience tonight and joining us all the way from Pennsylvania. And I want to thank everyone for attending, and we'll hope to see you online at another ISIS event very soon. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>